discussion. Um, we had three breakout room inquiries on the table. What is the thesis? How was the thesis produced? Um, how is the symbol of the Black Panther emblematic of the people of Loudoun County? And what stood out to you most about the reading? Uh, who would like to share what was discussed in their breakout rooms? I, I could go ahead. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I want to talk about the third one. Okay. The, what stood out the most? Uh, I think what was the craziest part was the the shooting scene or the assassination scene, should I say? Because that was kind of like super sketch. Um, the reading was a little, I wouldn't say tough. It was just hard to kind of see where everything was going. So I had to like search for backgrounds and find out what's really going on and stuff like that. Um, I wasn't really familiar with uh, Kwame. How do you say his last name? Uh, Ture. 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 Okay. Um, I think I've seen like a movie or something about him where he's supposed to do like a speech in an area or something, but I don't remember that movie that much. Um, but uh, yeah, that scene where they like, the cops weren't telling anybody about information about when they're getting released or bonds being paid or anything like that. And then they were like released and it was really quiet. And then there's like an assassin who started like shooting and killed. I, if I'm not mistaken, shot like the, the white mm -hmm. people that joined the party um, or that was like the main goal of that. And then I guess the assassin was just like, might as well just start shooting everybody else or whatever. Um, that was very, that was very like, that stuck out to me. Cause I was like, wow. Cause the way he also, when he's writing the story, when like he's explaining everything in such a, I don't want to say calm, but it's almost like, like fluid. Like it was like, it was natural. Like he, like he's been there. Like this wasn't like a, oh my gosh, you know, like super like blowing it out of proportion. It was just kind of like, yeah, this is, this is what's happening. Like literally like, and this is how like we've been living and like, you know, it doesn't really, it was almost like the person wasn't phased, yeah. you know? And, um, yeah, I thought that was very interesting. And I think that also goes into the, what was the first question? Um, the thesis and how is the thesis produced? Oh yeah, the way the way it was produced, it was like, uh, it was like a story. It was like a story told, but without any, like I couldn't really get the thesis as I kept reading it. And then I was like, okay, uh, to, in my perspective, the thesis was how the Black Panther Party like actually started, where it originated from, what it actually stands for because how I guess when I was raised in my lifetime and what I thought about it was just like, oh, okay, there was a Black Panthers and it's like the term radical is usually mm -hmm. always like mixed in with that. Mm -hmm. And I never understood like why, but now it makes sense because <clears throat> a lot of people tried to like stop them for sure from organizing this, but definitely uh, another thing where I would probably have to say that thesis has to do with like education mm -hmm. and how like education was like such a big purpose here, you know, like they actually, like they knew that the Democrats run everything, like we're running everything and then they and pretty much elect themselves as like a party for themselves and for others who, you know, who didn't agree with Democrats and Republicans which is something I could relate to nowadays because it's it's the same BS, if you ask me, you know? Republicans and Democrats, I mean, reading this, definitely you'd think that Alabama, like Democratic, like what, really? Like you would think it was always Republican. But then if you actually look at the past, they actually stood for like the opposites. Like what Republicans stand for now, Democrats stood for back then. So it's almost like they're actually the same people they just kind of like trade off things. And then, so if we don't move away from a Republican democratic like thing, like no other party could join in. So your voice can't be really heard unless you join one of these political parties. And I could keep going. I mean, it also kind of goes into the, I forgot the other guy's name who was a father father something oh, oh yeah 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 the, uh, like the priest who was helping organize yeah he yeah. was part of like the christian uh -huh. party right yeah. and then he had to leave that um 
but because he was part of that Christian thing, he had made a name for himself under religion. I think this all ties into how religion and, you know, political parties are no different than like, you know, controlling society and how that moves along. But yeah, I think it's really interesting. Thank you, Kanye. We'll get one more and then we'll jump into my notes. Um, who else would like to share what was discussed in the breakout rooms? Aldo, uh, what did your group talk about? Uh, I was in Carney's group. Okay. Uh, so we basically talked about that. But um, I could share my own opinion on what I found interesting. Yeah, please. So uh, another thing I found interesting was that in loans, it said that, uh, let me take out the reading. All right. Um, it said that, and I quote, half of our people were below the poverty level. Most of the other half at or barely above it. Mm -hmm. And another thing that I found interesting that the women uh, commuted to Montgomery for housework and they only paid them $4 a day. Yeah. Yeah. So that's something I found interesting. And, and uh, what's it called? I also found interesting how uh, there was this one person from loans that said that, um, I'm sorry, I, let me find uh, the quote that he said. Mm-hmm. He said, in this country, turn the other cheek and these here pecker woods will hand you back half of what you're sitting on. Yeah. If you do come back, you're going to have to find a different way to come in here. So with, with, with that passage and what Aldo is kind of speaking to is like the tension um, that's ensuing around this notion of nonviolence, right? And, and that's kind of where I'll, I'll pick up on my notes and we'll, we'll move from there. Um, I kind of messed up. I, I really should have assigned the Malcolm X reading first, just from a, um, from a temporal standpoint and from a chronological standpoint, the Malcolm X reading would predate this reading, but um, we'll work just from here. Uh, the reason I mentioned that is because part of what's providing some of the tensions as it pertains to nonviolence is the assassination of Malcolm X, right? Um, and because of Malcolm X's assassination, uh, a lot of the younger people within the civil rights movement of the time are becoming really dissatisfied with this idea of nonviolence. And, and that's echoed in the passage that Aldo just read for us, right? Um, so what's happening is we have, well, let me, let me back up a little bit just to kind of provide some further, oh shit, provide some cl- further clarification. Give me one second, y'all. Spill my shit. Okay. So the book that you, you've read the chapter from is entitled Ready for Revolution. Um, this is the autobiography of Stokely Carmichael, um, formerly known as Stokely Carmichael, um, also known as Kwame Ture. Um, Very large autobiography. I want to say like 778 pages. Um, But what this biography does, it gives you a very detailed and comprehensive account of the civil rights movement um, from its inception all the way through the Black Power movement into what I would like to call um, the neo-Pan-African movement. Um, And and Kwame Ture is an individual who serves as a um, pillar in each of these historical epics of Black liberation, right? Um, And and to to Carney's point, this is why it's so natural and, and conversational, if you will, because the autobiography, the method is literally Kwame and Michael Thelwell in a conversation, right? And, and they're they're recounting the happenings of the civil rights movement. And while Kwame's doing the recounting, Michael Thelwell is, is typing out and producing the text of this page, right? So this kind of speaks to 
the the um, casual nature of it, um, the matter of fact nature of it, and how um, he's able to account for these seemingly um, phenomenal occurrences very casually and matter of fact, because these are things that happened to him and he's thinking back in the past about these uh, circumstances and these happenings. Um, so another backdrop to this chapter is the um, what they call Bloody Sunday. And it was a, a march that would go from um, through Montgomery, Alabama. Um, and so the, actually, before I even go too far into that, I think we need to also understand. So within the civil rights movement of the time, right, there was different factions. Um, the major faction was the SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conf Con Conference, I believe it is. Um, the second faction was SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, Kwame was a member of SNCC, right? There were some other organizations that made up um, the civil rights movement at the time, but I just don't remember them off the top. But another way to think about the SCLC, um, which is ran by Martin Luther King, and SNCC, which at the time is ran by Kwame Ture, is this is like SNCC is the more younger guard, right? It's, it's the more youth culture of the civil rights movement and the SCLC is more of the older guard, right? Um, the SCLC is really resting its hat on nonviolence, whereas SNCC is saying like, we might wanna reconsider this position. Um, in fact, within the pages of the, of the text of Ready for Revolution, um, Kwame goes through great detail to articulate how a lot of Martin Luther King's politi politicizing towards the end of his career, for example, his stance on um, anti-war was due to the work of SNCC, right? He talks about how there would be in hours, I'm sorry, there'll be in meetings that would last sometimes 15 hours just to kind of come to a consensus on a certain position. One of those being the, the war on Vietnam, right? And it was through the work of SNCC, through the work of Kwame Ture that got Martin Luther King to take a position of nonviolence. I'm sorry, to take a position of being anti-war. Um, it was also the work of SNCC and the work of um, Kwame Ture that allowed uh, Martin Luther King to be more attentive to things like the workers' rights and the people's rights, in which he starts to organize for more towards the end of his career, okay? Um, so these are some of the backdrops that informs the chapter that you all engaged. So one, SNCC viewed this march as an opportunity to mobilize and organize the people of Loudoun County. Um, I, I believe, as Aldo pointed out, right, um, one of the poorest counties in the in the area, really at the time in the country, if you read further, um, but also one of the most highly concentrated Black populations as well, right? So SNCC felt that this would be the opportune area in time to go in and organize this. Um, this, this, this county. Uh, it says SNCC has been, was um, organizing, sorry, was struggling around voters rights for a five year period, right? So struggling in the sense of how do we go about um, getting African people to understand the importance of the vote, right? But at the same time, SNCC was under the impression they understood very clean, keenly that the vote was not the overall end all, right? Um, there's gonna have to be some things that would go along with the vote in order for the vote to be um, effective as a conduit to shift power to the black community, right? And it says in August of 1965, the Voting Rights Act became law. And then this kind of caused SNCC to kind of look at um, this process of voting a little bit differently and also look at Loudest County a little bit differently. Um, this gave SNCC the idea of why don't we establish an independent party within Loudest County, um, to Carney's point, right? Something that's separate from the Democrats and the Republicans. And Kwame chose to go with the Panther as the symbol to um, represent that independent party. Um, but there was two internal factors that SNCC would have to overcome in order to like uh, be successful at what they tried to do in regards to politicizing Loudest County. Um, one was the need for inclusion. So if you think about the civil rights movement, one of the major um, aims or goals of the civil rights movement was integration, right? So at the time, uh, the United States was a very much segregated society, right? Um, so some of the uh, thrust of the civil rights movement were to do things like integrate universities, 
um, integrate segregated lunch counters, right? Um, integrate segregated um, transportation. So once SNCC came up with the idea of establishing an independent political party, a lot of the black folks within Loudest County felt like, well, this is just falling into the trap of, of, of segregation, excuse me. So now not only has my education been um, segregated, not only has my sociality been segregated, but now my political identity will be further segregated by establishing a separate um, political party, right? So this is one of the, um, the ideological shortcomings that the people of Loudoun County had that SNCC would have to overcome, okay? Um, the second one would just be their self-confidence, right? They didn't feel that they had the political um, intelligence or the will to establish their own political party and situate somebody to run for office. So those were the two obstacles that SNCC had to overcome. And they were able to overcome those by a few things, by a few mechanisms. One was political education. And this goes back to Carney's point. And he says that, you know, education is an implicit but core theme of the, of the chapter. And he's spot on with that. Um, and they would go about educating the, the people of Loudest County by letting them know how politics works, um, letting them know how um, taxation works. And more importantly, what they found to be most effective was educating the people of Loudest County about the opponent, right? And, and making them aware of their educational background. And what that did for the people of Loudest County, it humanized their opponent. And their opponent didn't seem like someone who could not be beat. It actually gave them more confidence, okay? And, and the... SNCC being attentive to how the confidence would bubble up through this political education, um, it would allow them to establish what, what were called freedom schools, right? And they would create little tent cities within Loudest County, and the people of Loudest County would be able to come to these tent cities or these freedom schools and be educated. Um, in the freedom schools, they would be taught African history. Um, they'll be they would hear the recordings and lectures of Malcolm X. And they will just become more conscious and more politicized about their possibility of African people. Now, um, Carney kind of touched on this um, in the sense of how repressive and, um, and terroristic the sheriff of Loudoun County was. Um, and so what ends up happening is these freedom schools that were established would come under gunfire by the Ku Klux Klan and by the sheriff of the town, right? And again, mind you how I started off this lecture, there's a tension at play as how will the civil rights movement going forward remain nonviolent, right? And once these shootings ensued, um, the tension kind of kicks up. And the members of SNCC who are working within Loudoun County decide to um, use the arm, actually, excuse me, the people of Loudoun County, right? The people themselves um, decided that they are not gonna sit here and allow themselves to be shot. Um, hence the passage that Aldo read, right? If you turn the other cheek, they're gonna hand back to you what you're sitting on, right? So they decide to organize themselves in post and when the Ku Klux Klan and the sheriff tries to um, assault the freedom schools, um, the people of Loudoun County and SNCC would shoot back, right? And that became so successful that SNCC authorized Kwame Ture to go into the large urban areas of like Chicago, of New Orleans, of California, of New York, and bring the most, well, the most gangster people of them areas, right? down to Loudoun County and form what they call the Deacons of Defense, right? And these Deacons of Defense would be armed groups that would allow for the, the ed political education that was taking place in Loudoun County to continue, um, allow for the march to be safe, um, allow for the people of Loudoun County to vote when the time came for them to vote. So it essentially it gave them the cloak of protection that SNCC needed in order that, for them to do their exercise, their organizing, right? And this is this idea of the deacons of defense. But this deacons of defense, well, before I go there. Okay. Um, and, and so once they've established, SNCC has established their independent political party, as I mentioned, they are gonna choose the symbol of the Panther as the symbol of the political party. Um, the reason why they chose the Panther 
is the way that the panther operates, the nature of the panther, it won't bother nobody, right? It keeps to itself, but once the panther becomes threatened or attacked, it's going to defend itself and its family viciously. And Kwame says that that reflected um, perfectly, right? It was serendipitous in the way that it embodied the people of um, Loudoun County. So this is why he chose the panther as the symbol for their independent party. But this idea of the deacons of defense and the political power of the panther would pick up and it would be a, um, a debate, if you will, a, a battle, if you will, a beef, if you will, a rift around who would take this idea of the panther forward. And um, you know from a close read that Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale would be the individuals who would take the Panther um, mantle and kind of make that into the Black Panther Party that we're mostly familiar with. Um, one thing I do want to point out, though, I, I, and, I, and I'll frame it in the form of a question. Who knows the Black Panther Party's full name? Right, They have a full name, and it's not just the Black Panther Party. Who knows what their full name is? Nobody? So the Black Panther Party's full name was the Black Panther Party of Self-Defense, right? And, and I think that it's important that we centralize this idea of self-defense as it pertains to the Black Panther Party. Because oftentimes, as Carney points out, right, they are positioned as radical, which devalues the work that they do. Because in fact, they were designed specifically to defend the community that they, they come out of. Um, we know from reading this that the origins of the Black Panthers, which were the deacons of defense, again, were to defend the people of Loudoun County. So oftentimes when you don't um, add that complete title to the Black Panther Party, you're, you're doing them a disservice, right? Because really, it's really about serving the community and then protecting the community. Um, I wanna read, just one passage from the text about how um, Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale would become uh, the Black Panther Party. Um, so I'm looking at the bottom of page 476. Um, this is Kwame talking to Michael Thelwell about a brother named Comfort who would tell Kwame about how the Black Panther Party um, in Oakland would be established. He says, um, but I knew Comfort. We spent a lot of time together in Laudis. I knew he was serious. I knew his seriousness. He we had confidence in, in each other, so I knew I could depend on him to tell me exactly what was going down, which he did. He said, okay, what happened was that Huey and his boys just flashed guns on everyone. At a meeting, I asked, he said, no, man, one by one on an individual basis. It was nothing but a cold-blooded Bogart, man. Now this brother Comfort was solidly built. You could just look at him and see that you didn't want to bring no guerrilla mess to him on any level. I know he had been trained in the military. Maybe, I'm not sure, even with battlefield experience. And I know he had some trained cadres around him. So I don't think he was intimidated. This is Comfort talking. If we struggle over the, over the Panther name with these dudes, it will go to gunfire, man. Warfare over this is silly. That makes no sense at all. But they hell bent on being the Black Panther Party and ready to go to war over it. He explained that Seals and Newton's background in an Oakland street game. So he Comfort is telling Kwame that Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seal, they have backgrounds or origins in gangs in Oakland, right? I think they've advanced beyond gang mentality. They think they've advanced beyond gang mentality because they have adopted revolutionary slogans now. But that gang mentality is still very much there. And Black people can end up killing each other over a humble. That's stupid. So why was he withdrawing? It simply wasn't worth a gun war, which essentially meant that Bobby and Huey became the Black Panther Party in California. So this is how the Black Panther Party um, for Self-Defense was established um, through what this brother Comfort calls um, street gang tactics, right? Um, through a, what he called a cold-blooded Bogart. Um, but again, 
to understand and situate the importance of the fact that this was steeped and emerges out of the need for self-defense, right? And even when we get later into the semester and we go into like the origins of gang culture, right? You see how even gang culture is really steeped in the idea of self-defense and defending your community. Um, so I'll, I'll put a pin in my um, notes and we'll transition to our fishbowl. Um, remember, you have two a semester. Um, you could talk about my notes. You could talk about your journals. You could talk about the breakout room conversation. All that's on the table. Um, is there anyone who needs, or sorry, anybody wants to volunteer to fishbowl? Okay, I'll call um, at random. Um, Carlos, are you prepared to first fishbowl today? Carlos Boni, are you prepared to fishbowl today? All right. So you used your one pass for the semester, Carlos. Um, Alfonso, are you prepared to fishbowl today? Oh, can I pass today? Yeah. So you used your one pass for the semester also, Alfonso. Um, Rafael, are you prepared to fishbowl today? Uh, do I have uh, one uh, one fishbowl done already? Uh, I believe so. Um, I could double check while I get some other people, but I believe you have one. Okay. Then, yeah. Can I go? Okay. Good. So I got, hold on, Rafael, we got you. And then Destiny, you would like to go also? Yes. Okay. Uh, Professor, I'd also like to go. Alda. Okay, thank you, Alda. So that will be our three um, for today. It will be um, Raphael, Aldo, and Destiny. Uh, whoever would like to start it off is on you. Um, I guess I'll start up. I also find this uh, reading a bit difficult to comprehend because of all the stuff that was happening. Uh, what I really didn't know was the fact that the Black Panthers, I mean, in high school, it was something different compared to learning it right now. Um, the fact that, oh, we're not gonna do anything if there's any type of threat happening. And how the rating, I was like, oh, wow, that's, that's actually pretty cool. The fact that they're there, you know, protection. But yeah, if something happens, you know, we're, we're there to protect you. And there was another section of the reading where how they came into town and I guess some of the organizers try to do something, uh, I guess, register to vote. Cause not, there's like 10 or 12,000 people that weren't registered. Mm -hmm. And the fact that um, they're like, oh, we'll be back. We're gonna come back with, uh, to help out. But once some someone said that, oh yeah, that's what they all say. But then next, you know, it, one year later they had everything organized you know, for a, what was it, a protest, right? Or- the March. Yeah, March. And um, yeah, that's that's what really got me interesting. Well, what I found really interesting. Uh, really. Thank you, Rafael. Uh, who's next? I'll go. Um, I was gonna ask a quick question though. Yeah. How do you pronounce the county's name? It's Low. Loud. How do you? Loudus. Loudus. Okay. Loudus County. Yep. Okay, so I thought that the like when I was reading this, I thought that it was highly unfair the fact that the people in the loudest loudest county. <laughs> like how there was by far way more black people than white and yet none of them were registered to vote um not only that but like a lot of the percentage of them lived in poverty and i felt like i felt like they weren't really given any power at all but when they did try to gain some power it went wrong and they either ended up half like either half of them or a good amount of them ended up homeless or shot at yeah and i i really thought it was crazy how um, that like that would have never happened to someone if they were white in that county. Yeah. And even if it was a small amount of white people, they still had power over everybody else. Yeah. Um, I'm glad that they had continued to fight and spread their power through the Panthers. Thank you, Destiny. Um, Aldo? Uh, to build off on what you said in your notes, Professor, um, I think it's very important to <clears throat> to state that the Black Panther Party was focused on self-defense 
and not radical because it's um it's very possible for some people to misinterpret that and for to start thinking that the black panther party was just out of acting out of revenge or vengeance and something like that when they weren't they were actually acting as self-defense like for the schools and for all the the clan members that were assaulting the the town yeah. so yeah um, some uh in some history textbooks of high school they didn't really state that the black panther party was for self-defense they just said that it was mainly uh how do i say it uh yeah, basically that just a kind of retail a violent group that didn't they made them seem violent yes. when they really weren't. They were just trying to protect their people. Yeah. Um, so you know, if I may, I, I kind of want to continue with all those uh, musings. Uh and, and I want to talk a little bit, if you will, about violence, about this idea of violence and how it becomes um, authenticated or authorized, right? Um, and really what makes violence okay is who is using the violence, right? Um, in fact, there's a term that's used to authenticate or validate the use of violence. And you'll hear it used with the police quite a bit, right? I think that's the probably the best way that we'll hear um, the authorization and the validation of violence in our context is typically through um, contact with police. And what they call that is um, force, right? Um, obsessive use of force, right? Really, when they're saying force, they're saying violence. But what happens is where the, disti where the distinction gets drawn is because when people do it, right, when the masses do it, um, when the citizens do it, then it's irresponsible and then it's violence, right? But when the state does it, when the police does it, when the, arm does, when the army does it, when the military does it, it's force. And force is the term that justifies, right? Um, even think about how they use these terms like violence as it pertains to people's interaction and response to property, right? That's why when you hear things like um, when, when rebellions are happening, right? Um, when revolts are happening or what the dominant society may call riots, right? They're saying they always throw the violence on there. They always use violence to describe the happenings, right? Even violence towards buildings take a precedent over the violence that's done to people that they call force that starts the protest. Does, does that make sense when I'm telling you the distinction between violence and force and how they're able to um, delegitimize certain acts of force and call them violent just because of the people who are engaging in those activities, right? Um, how was this country established? Through violence. Right. There were people here on this land prior to Europeans. Right. And through violent acts, Europeans were able to maintain this land. Right. But it will become legitimate because of force. Another way to think about this. What caused the Europeans to come to this land in the first place? Somebody tell me what caused the Europeans to defect from Europe? and come to the Americas. What was it? Um, escape like the queen and king kind of thing, like their political party over there. To escape religious persecution, and they were trying to avoid taxation without representation. That's what caused the Europeans to leave Europe and come to what they call the new world, right? In fact, they engaged in a violent revolution to defect from Europe to come to the new world. Right. So when African people are experiencing religious persecution and taxation with no representation or to be, to be a unpaid labor force, and we seek to use the same means that the European used to liberate themselves, right? Our actions are delegitimized because they are viewed to be violent, right? So you see how even language is used to um, 
subordinate certain actions and authenticate other actions, right? So this is how this idea and this notion of violence becomes um, polarizing one. Um, and, and two, you really see this taken up at a large scale with um, the Black Panther Party, right? Um, because they actually get into things like shootouts. Um, for those familiar with um, like the East Southern portion of Los Angeles, thinking about um, the major street central and the cross street of 41st street. So on 41st and central in Los Angeles was the Black Panther um, headquarters in South LA. Um, when the police, when the LAPD was trying to neutralize Black Panther headquarters, excuse me, not the LAPD, the national police forces um, were trying to neutralize Black Panther headquarters and they sought to attack the LA chapter of the Black Panther Party, right? There was an 11 hour, 11 hour shootout that ensued, right? And the Black Panther Party's members of Los Angeles were able to defend their, um, location for 11 hours, right? Um, until they just ran out of bullets and they had to surrender, right? So when you talk about these acts of violence, right? How, how is it that, how is it fair, if you will? How is it legitimate, if you will, to have a whole police force, right? Tanks, um, these other large ammunitions and large type of gunfire uh, capabilities against about four or five or six individuals um, without tanks, without any armor, right? And they're able to defend themselves for, th for 11 hours, right? So how do you legitimize those type of acts and call that force and that be okay, right? So these are some of the, the contradictions that groups like the Black Panther Party was able to kind of bring to the fore. And what, where you see Malcolm X kind of come into play with this, uh, he gets pinned as violent through rhetoric. So what does that mean? Somebody tell me what, what, I, what I mean when I say that Malcolm X is pinned as violent through rhetoric. What does that mean? I hear, I'm going to take an educated guess. Yeah. Uh, it, means, um, uh, it means that they, they kind of, uh, sorry, I'm looking for a word. Uh, they correlate how they see one thing with another thing. So like him being involved with uh, the Black Panther movement uh, or, or doing his thing, they related that to like the Black Panther movement and what they called it back then, which led to being called like a terrorist or someone who wants to do harm. So another way to think about this, um, do you buy, and you may not know the history of Malcolm X like I do, but do you know um, of any examples of Malcolm X engaging any acts of violence? Do you know, have you ever heard about Malcolm X shooting a gun? Have you ever heard about Malcolm X whooping somebody's ass? Have you ever heard about Malcolm X himself engaging in any forms of violence? Has anybody? I've never heard that, but I have definitely heard that he was like a terrorist or someone who promoted terrorism. That's right. all. But I've never heard any other story other than that. No, and, and you won't because it never happened. Um, in fact, one of Malcolm X's major beefs with the Nation of Islam is it would not take a military stance against the oppression of, of African people, right? So he's never been involved in any type of violence, but because of what he says, right, the power structure can pin him as violent, right? Um, they, they'll use the excuse that he inspired the violence of the Black Panther Party through his rhetoric, right? So even someone's speech can be positioned as violent through the power structures. And this is why we have to be very careful about how we legitimate, legitimize certain things and who is the authority to legitimize certain things, right? Um, I'm curious to hear other thoughts about either this conversation on violence or anything else that was discussed um, or with, that you've read um, from the reading. Michelle, what are your thoughts? You've been quiet today. What was that? Can you repeat it? I'm sorry. What did you think about 
the reading or anything that was discussed today? About the reading? About the reading, about anything that's discussed. What, was, what are your thoughts? Well, I just thought it was interesting that <clears throat> in the part of the, the reading, when, like, after the march, they went out to see, like, the aftermath of it, and they ended up being near this, like, it was technically a, a school for, like, for, like, African kids, but it wasn't called a school. It was called, I don't forgot what it was called, but it was, like, a training center. And then they were handing out, like, pamphlets to the kids to give to their parents. And they ended up getting pulled over by a cop saying that they couldn't give out communist stuff around, like, a school. And they were like, but it's not a school. It's a training center. and that. And the cop just let them go. And it was just interesting that like nothing happened to them. We just like let them go. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. Um, other thoughts on the reading or what was discussed? Carlos, you've been quiet today. What's your thoughts on our conversation or the reading? Uh, Carlos? Alfonso, how about you? What are your thoughts on the reading or the conversation today? Uh, what stood out to me was um, how about eight families own like 90% of the loads um, population of 15,000. And 12,000 were um, African, and none of them were able to vote. And also, half of the people were below poverty level, and the other half were at or barely above it. Yeah. And the largest town was Fort Deposit, um, which was the clan stronghold. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, I remember uh, what Denise said, Destiny said earlier, how um, there's, like, so little white people but yet they had all the power um I thought that was crazy. yeah but, but, but you know what like let's not like let's not like um like let's not make that bigger than what it really is right because let's, let's think about it um how is our wealth situated here right um one percent of the population earned, owns ninety nine percent of the wealth, right? So th those numbers aren't as staggering as they may appear when you think about even today how wealth is um, controlled, how wealth is amassed, and how how um, money is distributed, right? Um, also, something that Carney said kind of stuck with me in the beginning of the of of today. Um, this idea of us being stagnated by a two-party system, right? And, and the only way that you could um, have any type of political ground is if you situate yourself within the Republican or the Democratic Party, right? Um, and I'm thinking about the state of our nation now, and I'm thinking about the work that was done, especially specifically in the Black community, um, around voting rights and around making sure that the Biden Harris administration was placed in office. And, you know, it's been some time with them in office now. And a lot of the hope that folks had, specifically in the Black community, for the Biden Harris administration has been eroded. Um, and I think without argument, those who were advocating for the Biden-Harris administration from the Black community feel let, let down, right? And I, and I think I could even extend that to a lot of people within the American society who advocated and, and organized for the Biden-Harris administration feel left down, let down. So I think this is like, there's two ways that I'm trying to have this conversation. One is um, 
the black folks insanity around the democratic party the democratic party right because they say if you do the same thing over and over and over again ex expecting different results that's the definition of insanity right so there's an insanity there's a psychosis that the black community has as it pertains to the um, democratic party and then two um, a broader conversation as it pertains to um, the american society as a whole being stagnated by this this two-party system because again i don't think that most people who would consider themselves democrats are pleased excuse me with the job that's being done within the democratic party right and um bernie sanders offers an interesting uh, meditation on a tri-party system or a three-party system because a lot of his platform is ran on a socialist idea right ideas like free health care those are socialist platforms ideas like free education those are socialist platforms um how many of you all are familiar with free lunch in, in your k-12 through education or the ability to receive free lunch in k-12 through anybody familiar with that okay kind of yeah. i mean not yeah i mean there i think it, it depends on your family mm -hmm. income right and yep. how that what what makes you eligible to have free lunch or have to pay for it right so do you know does anyone know where that came from the idea of free lunch where that started from the black panther party so what they had um they realized that students in oakland were not doing well in school because they weren't fed before going to school so what they established was the free breakfast program. So what you would be able to do um, before you drop your child off at school, um, you would be able to go into the Black Panther headquarters and they would provide you with, with breakfast, right? Um, this idea of free breakfast would eventually evolve into the free lunch program that you know we all are familiar with. Um, things like healthcare clinics in local urban areas is also a direct byproduct of the work of the black panther party um they established sickle cell um prevention centers within the urban areas um of areas spaces like oakland spaces like los angeles spaces like chicago spaces like new york right um those sickle cell prevention um spaces would evolve into like the urban medical clinics right these are two examples of socialist programs, right? These are socialist programs. Socialism is the idea that the people will control the means of production, right? So instead of the work and the set of your labor going to the owners of the companies, it goes to the people, right? Socialism is the idea that everyone, regardless of your age, your race, your sex, your class, everyone should have food, clothing, shelter, um, a job in education and healthcare, right? Those are fundamental principles that are deserving of the of humanity. This is a belief of socialism, right? So thinking about what Carney's saying and thinking about how we're limited by this two-party system, and really they're both what they call two sides of the same coin, right? What the Republicans do is no different than the Democrats do, they just do it in a different way. Um, and all of them are keeping us from doing things that could really benefit society, which are offered in socialist political models, right? And I think we would, as a society, would be, it would behoove us to be more attentive to socialist principles and socialist practices, because that's gonna allow for the bottom, right, to be elevated, right? Um, all right, we'll end it there, unless anyone has any uh, last minute comments, questions, or concerns. Um, let me pull up our reading for now.